Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the future of short form, today's panel. My name is Bernie Sue, and I am your moderator today. Um, so just to give a quick background on myself, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm a web series showrunner, most notably for the Elizabeth Diaries, Emma Approved on YouTube, and Artificial, which recently wrapped uh, its third season on Twitch. Uh, I've been doing web series for over uh, 10 years, but today I am just your moderator. So uh, let's have a great panel. Um, I'm going to be asking questions from a creator's point of view, because I am a creator, just like many of you in this panel. And uh, I like to have a very uh, open discussion. So please get those questions ready. Um, I want this to be as helpful and as educational for all of you. Um, and let's have a great panel. Uh, just a couple of quick notes. Terrible Fest is the premier annual indie web TV and web series festival in the U.S. and the new home for digital creative talent in the TV industry. They honor, or we honor, the year's best content and provide a space for the next generation of creators to connect with industry executives, grow their network, learn new skills, and build community. Today, we are welcoming industry, industry professionals to explore what does the future of high quality short form look like and how it will continue to thrive. Uh, which is very interesting to me because um, I, I've kind of been at it for a bit, so I'm really curious myself. I, we would like to thank our fest sponsors, including Dell Technologies, AMC Networks, Shutterstock, and Adorama. Uh, if this is your first event with us, just a few notes about interacting with our platform. You can click the TV icon on the left side of your screen, which I believe would be this for you. Uh, nope. <laughs> anyway, let your left side of the screen to open the virtual screening room to watch any of the shows. You can click on anyone in the audience to start a private video chat with them. I, we won't be able to hear you up here on stage, but you can comment on my hat and shirt if you like. And if you haven't already, allow your browser to enable your camera and your microphone so we can hear your questions. Uh, click the gear, icon, the gear icon in your top right corner and change the setting to enable your camera and mic. Most importantly, we'll be taking your questions and comments later in the session. Uh, probably sooner than later. So please participate. Use the hand icon to raise your hand if you have a question and would, would like to come up on stage, virtual stage with us. Or if you'd like to submit a question uh, on screen, click on the question mark bubble and type it to us. Now, I'd like to welcome our guest, Lily Ladwig from Group 9 Studios and Kevin Dreyfus, VP, Digital Content Studio for AMC Network, Sundance TV, IFC Channel, and BBC America. Let's put them up here. There they are. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, make sure you're all connected. It says you're connecting, Lily, but I see you moving in the background. I can hear you, so I'm just going to go with it. All right. Okay. While Lily's connecting, Kevin, why don't you uh, introduce us to yourself? Tell us about yourself. Uh, so I'm Kevin Dreyfus. I uh, run the uh, internal digital content studio for AMC's uh, scripted network. So that's AMC, Sundance TV, BBC America, IFC, and we basically create digital content, mostly short and mid-form video, although we also do VR and ARGs and pretty much everything else you can think of uh, for either connected to our original shows and IP or creating original digital IP, um, uh, as well as using our talents to do some combination of all that. Um, and our team is making content for currently, as we talk, you know, Facebook, Twitch, Reddit, YouTube, our platforms, Fast channels, Pluto, a bunch of things I can't even remember right now. Um, and it's been a crazy and exciting, particularly last, I'd say, three, four years. This whole space is really uh, blown up. So that's where I come from. Nice. Lily, go ahead. Can you can you hear me and see me now? Yes, I believe so. Great. Go for okay, it. Okay, good. Um, I'm Lily Ladwig. I'm the director of original programming from group, for Group 9 Studios, which is part of Group 9 Media. Um, group 9 Media owns five digital first media brands, um, including Now This, Seeker, The Dodo, Pop Sugar, and Thrillist. Um, and all of those uh, kind of news brands, they have their own editorial teams stationed all over the country, and they're constantly putting out their own short form and mid form content, mostly through social platforms. And what my team does is I'm based in Los Angeles. I work with each of those different brands to kind of figure out what um, stories are really resonating with their audiences and um, where we could then develop these stories further and sell them to third party buyers, which would be like a Netflix or it could be um, or Facebook Watch or something like that. And so the most recent show that I, that we've launched is on Netflix. Um, we have a show with the Dodo, which is our animal brand. 
Um, and it's a mid-form series, uh, and it's one of uh, Netflix's first uh, children's unscripted shows. It's called Izzy's Koala World. Um, we're very excited about that. Nice. Uh, I love the dodo. I actually watched it myself. <laughs> Shameless. Okay. Anyway, so let's get into the uh, the first obvious question. Uh, literally, the uh, title of the panel: the future of short form. So, uh, what? And I'll, I'll set this up a little bit. So, I've been doing a web series short form for ten years, <clears throat> primarily scripted. But I know that unscripted really does dominate uh, what we watch on short form content on our devices and so forth. And I uh, we started with this kind of uh, like. Platform every platform best distribution. Maybe you get an ad revenue split through YouTube partners or some type of thing. Um, and we have a lot of creators in this in, in watching today on this on this uh, festival who are creating short form content. So what I guess we'll, we'll get to the marketplace for it first. But like, what do you think is the as kind of the aesthetic future of the of the format as we go TikToks and Trillers and uh, all these new platforms coming up? Just kind of. You know, no one knows the future exactly, but what are you what are you seeing from your side of the industry? Anybody? I, um, I'll start. I, I think what we've been seeing a lot lately is, um, and I I think that Bernie, you kind of hit the nail on the head here, talking about how the I guess the aesthetics are changing, and also like the fact that social media is such a huge driver right now. Um, we're often finding that when we are trying to partner with somebody like Facebook or YouTube where we are actually selling a show to them. They both Facebook and YouTube are, um, you know, they're commissioning um, mid form content. And to, just to make sure everybody kind of understands the, the words that I'm using short, there's like short form, mid form and long form. Uh, short form is basically something that is maybe around three or five minutes or less. At least this is how we, we define it where I work, Kevin, you might have different, um, definitions, but short form would be something that's like three, three or five minutes or less. Mid form is between like five and 15. And then long form is typically about a half an hour to an hour or feature film. And those typically are things that you would, you would be selling to like a, a, a premium streamer or, an, or a TV network or things like that. Um, that would be something that we refer to as linear programming as opposed to digital programming. Um, yeah. So even when we're working with somebody yeah. like a um, you know, these kind of premium mid form, short form buyers like could be Facebook and YouTube, they still really want talent attached that has huge followings on social media where we're kind of often will come up with an idea that we think is compelling. And then we will, to, in order to sell it, we partner with somebody who already has uh, a pretty big following. Um, Kevin, I know you've been working a lot in the, in the Twitch space. I'm, cu I'm curious to learn more about what, what that's been like. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that everything you said is right. I, I One thing I'd add is, um, and I think our definitions of video are very similar. I think because I am actually in-house at a network, we tend to, I mean, the shitty analogy we always use is like we're eating every part of the animal. Like we're creating content that can be used in all sorts of different manners. We can use it as everything from 15-minute mid-form uh, for platforms where uh, that can, you know, make money for us. We can get a brand involved. We can get uh, ad revenue, and then we'll chop it up into uh, what we'll call sort of minute-long podbusters to air linearly, which will actually uh, air as during ad pods as ways to increase yeah. watchability of ads. Like so, everything we make, we tend to have these very complex kind of ways we break down all the content, trying to think ahead as much as we can, and it's hard to do that all the different usages. I think that, and just a segue into what you asked about Twitch, we started about a month ago, so it is very early days. We started a Walking Dead Universe channel on Twitch. Uh, so it's an entire channel that we're doing in partnership with Twitch um, that is basically scheduled, it's live streams um, uh, connecting to hardcore Walking Dead Universe fans on Twitch. We're cycling in and out cast members and other sort of super fans and we actually, our hosts are uh, streamers that they, you know, they don't really have. Um, when you said sort of talent, it's very funny. Like in 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 the studio world, why I'm talent used to mean like we're talking about TV or movie talent or celebrity. When for places like Twitch, the kind of people we're looking for are people who have digital followings, live stream followings, people who have YouTube channels with significant. 
uh, followings, people who can be on Twitch and have concurrent views that are, uh, those are the kinds of metrics we're looking at now, which is a very different world. But so this Twitch channel is, um, even there, the primary objective of that is to create a home in a place where we have not played before, create content that um, really connects to that audience in a very authentic Twitch way. And to do that, that means we're constantly changing and testing and learning. We're only a month in and we've already cycled through probably five or six different show formats. But even as we go through that, we're capturing all of it to see, and it's still early days, if any of that content will also work in other platforms so that it can continue to have life uh, after Twitch. Um, so we're constantly trying to see how we can cycle things through our ecosystems and all these other potential pop partners with uh, One Piece Creed. Nice. Great answer. I don't even remember, I don't remember the question because <laughs> I wasn't here. But I'm back. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I don't want I, I, Twitch, as someone who literally just did a show for Twitch, I, I find it to be such an, an interesting platform. Ironically, not short form. Um, in fact, short form this does not work on Twitch uh, at all. I, I, just the way it's built and, and all that stuff. So, um, but let's talk about, let's kind of go back to short form. Let's talk about, you know, a lot of creators here. I, so you, we, we, there, there's screenings going on basically right now uh, with creators in, in this chat, in, in, in this panel who are watching this. And they're thinking to themselves, probably, uh, at least some of them, uh, what am I going to do with my series? So you both have companies that um, have IPs and formats and so forth. So what what would you say is the win for them? Now, you know, to disregard, at least, you know, keep, keep a balance of like, you're not looking for specific things. Everybody looks for specific things. The stuff that Dodo is going to look, look for is look different than what AMC is going to look for. So th disregard the, the the verticals exactly. And let's talk about like, all right, you acquire something that you like, or is there, not maybe you specifically, where do these creators go with their, with their projects uh, from here? Either or. Um, I mean, that's a really good question. I've, uh, there are a number of different routes that somebody could go. I mean, I, I just, um, it's, it's hard for me not to think specific in terms of like how, how content and creators kind of come to me. Um, but I mean, the, and this is probably advice that's being given across the board, but I mean, the first thing is as much, as much content as, as everybody here can self-produce and self-distribute, the better, because then, then you're just further getting your name out, you're getting your stories out, you are building up social followings, that's just going to benefit you. And if you can do it, I mean, you can either do it across platforms, or you can kind of just focus on one so that you're kind of getting, I, you know, actually, that's a good question. A question I'm, I'd love to ask you, Kevin, as well, if you have a recommendation here, like, would it be better in some ways, it's good um, to like just focus on one. Like, if you say you just have like your YouTube, then you and you can direct everybody to your YouTube video. Then that would mean that you'll hit get more hits, and it'll be more impressive looking to people who are going to be viewing it than if you post the same exact video. I, it's it's like the opposite, I guess, of what you've been doing, Kevin. Where in, yeah. you you kind of want to pick pick your pick your platform. If you're self-producing, self-distributing, pick your platform, whether it's YouTube, whether it's on Facebook, um, I mean, in, in Instagram video, things like that. And then try to channel all of your viewers through social media to that place. So then you're going to get the most bang for your buck in terms of how many views you have, because that view number can be um, something that can be very impressive. Um, another way to go about it is... Um, uh, I would say to um, to again like to if, if there's a way to find a, uh, a a platform that is you know um, producing uh, like a kind of a bigger platform that's producing short form and mid form content like for example like Group Nine Media like one of our brands or something you know like like a BuzzFeed or um, uh, Bernie, you might even think of other places that might be good for this. And if there's a way for you to kind of get your content across to them and for them to then either amplify it or um, if they're impressed by it, help you to fund further episodes of it, that's another another way that you can go about, uh, again, getting your, getting your web series funded. Yeah, no, Lily, I think you're right on the... Um heavying up on a, on a platform. I think even in, even in what we do, we do start somewhere. So like if we're starting on Twitch, we are optimizing to use 
crappy corporate words, like we're optimizing for Twitch. That's the first priority. We have to be successful where we start. We have a show on YouTube we do with Coleman Domingo, who's on one of our shows, Fear the Walking Dead. It's like a cocktail show with him. It is built for YouTube. We are looking to build the audiences there. We have a show with Amanda Knox, um, uh, a true crime show that is built for Facebook Watch. It's made to connect to communities there. Now, we expect those all to continue to have this kind of long tail of international licensing and life on other media when cut down in different ways. But it's a great point that, like, pick a place and go in there. Um, I think with us, there's a couple, because we're kind of, we're also a group of traditional TV networks and SPOD uh, channels, there's a couple other ways that um, we're looking at short form and short form creators. One is like, yes, we are looking for creators and shows that have followings because just like everybody else, we're chasing views and fan bases. And um, I think that, we are in a transition phase between where we were uh, exclusively looking for outside talent to insert into the existing IP and worlds that we have um, to now where we are, where we are creating original IP that just lives in the digital space. Uh, so finding properties that can just live where they are, they don't need to be, uh, we don't have to take a great voice and then have them go write a Walking Dead webisode series or uh, uh, do a docu-series based around Breaking Bad. We can take some original IP, and if we think it fits, we can just use it as is or expand it as is. Um, but we, so in that way, finding somebody who has a voice and has a following, that's that's key. But I think that uh, the the what I just mentioned, the idea that we are also a collection of existing platforms that are hungry for voices means that all this stuff also is still sort of that traditional kind of calling card content to connect with showrunners, connect with our internal development people uh, at places like Shudder and Acorn and Sundance TV and Sundance Now who are all, you know, uh, really hungry to find some new voices. And I think um, the other thing I'll say, and this actually connects back to your question about sort of format and what people are doing right now, what the future looks like, you know, I think the world we're in, this COVID world, uh, even if we had a virus, even if we had a vaccine tomorrow, it's going to have lasting changes to the kinds of things we're watching for a good long time, um, and that means a lot of the formats um, that are uh, organic to uh, digital spaces are going to start to bleed out and be relevant in linear and SVOD and. Netflix and everywhere else where you wouldn't normally see that kind of uh, content thrive, I think it will. So like, I think one thing that you've probably heard this burning from Twitch is uh, one thing they said to us as we were standing up our channel there was that, you know, Twitch um, in quarantine kind of looks a lot like Twitch not in quarantine. Yeah. Um, so like in some ways they were already that, that's the platform that was ready. Uh, and therefore, and in some ways the world came to them through unfortunate circumstances, but I think that's going to be lasting. So I think there's a, more routes open for digital native creators uh, off digital now because of the world we're in. Very interesting. Um, I'll give you a quick Twitch story from my side because we we, we were uh, doing, we were in talks to do artificial season three at the beginning of this year. And then when COVID hit, I was like, oh crap, we're done. Like, like they're going to pull our show and we're going to lose our, our, our pickup. And, they, and when we had a talk, talk with them, they just went, uh, we're just doing all our shows remote now. You have, you have to figure out how to do remote production where you can't do the show. I'm like, well, that makes sense. All right, I'm going to figure it out. So, and so we do it. So our, our whole season is done, done as remote. Um, so you, yeah, you kind of pivot with the times. But I, I, I want to go back to something you both said about the kind of building up your own, we'll call it clout, right? Like like social following and so forth. So uh, and I'm going to preface this by saying like, Yes, I've been in short form for like 10 years, but I've been kind of out of it for the last two or three, mainly because I've been doing the show on Twitch, which technically is short form, but really isn't short form because it's really long form. Uh, it just happens to be on digital. So kind of before, especially the, the last couple of years, a terrible fest, uh, two years ago, whatever, the, the landscape was that uh, creators like those in the audience, I'm guessing, had, have made these web series, six episodes, 10 episodes, three episodes, whatever. They, they've blood, sweat, and tears. They self-funded. They made the show. And then they want that show to be successful. But this, but what I find to be the variable is what's their definition of success? Is it 
sell to an AMC or a television, not specifically AMC, but you know, a network. And here's the format. I created the show. Uh, that's my story. And I put it on uh, an AMC buys it. Or is it the calling card, as you mentioned, right? Like, it's like, oh, you're, this is a really good director, writer, storyteller. I want to work with them. I don't really care that much about this cool show they did. I want what's next from this person. And the, the, the third being that, um, which happens in Sterable's past, is that that IP that they've developed in Sterable, or presented in Sterable Fest, um, has then been picked up by a network to develop into long form, like a like a TV pilot or something like that. So those are the kind of the three areas of where everybody was looking at. From what you guys are describing, uh, and you know, we're, we're, we're a small group, right? but, we're, but I think the, the three of us together have a lot of experience in this. So what you guys are describing, it sounds like the current landscape is leaning toward that audience call, uh, clout, like social voice point of view. I have an audience. Um, it's and So it's almost like, Put the show out there, grow the audience, see if it works. You know, not every show works. We know that. Um, and would you would you kind of suggest that to the audience here? And by the way, audience, uh, ask questions in the chat. Go ahead and start queuing those up. But is that kind of the where you're you're seeing the 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 current landscape lean right now? Um. Oh yeah, I just want to. I think something so an example that maybe highlights this really, really well is um, Sarah Cooper, um, who I don't know if anybody's familiar with her, but she's a comedian and she became she utilized TikTok to kind of become um, go uh, this uh, in, at this point she's just this incredibly popular person in in the industry across in the entertainment industry, you know, across multiple different kinds of platforms. So she she does these impressions of or she does like basically um uh uh what's it called when uh like over was, Trump. yeah yeah, she, yeah. She did, Sarah Cooper CPR right like yes yeah. exactly yeah. yeah um and uh and then um you know she was getting very popular we like now this was interested in reaching out to her we my team gets uh from where we're represented by um, William Morris. Uh, and so they are always sending us these network mandates, meaning um, a TV network will be sending out like, okay, here's what we want to buy. And Freeform sent one and they were like, we want to work with Sarah Cooper. Anybody brings us ideas with Sarah Cooper. And now she has a Netflix series. So um, anyway, I just, I think that that's like just an example of somebody doing something, no high production value, just kind of thinking small, but, but um like small bites, but like lots of it, um, I think can be very beneficial when you're talking about, you know, building up cloud and having, having your calling card. Nice. Uh, great example. Um, very much a personality driven uh, example. I, a, a classic thing we all, we, in, in kind of web series lore, we refer to is uh, um, Issa Rae, awkward black girl, insecure. And I, people go, oh, was it Issa's talent or was it, awkward black girl that led to insecure and the audience that that built. And I would say it's a little bit of both in my opinion, but you know, you can, you can make your own, your own uh, assumption there. And then there's of course, Rachel Bloom, crazy ex-girlfriend, which is a pure talent drive. Like that she's on YouTube. I, Hey, maybe CW said the same mandate. We want to work with Rachel Bloom, <laughs> get her in here. Uh, let's do it. Um, Kevin, do you have any, uh, uh thing to, to add to that or any, any kind of observation there? Yeah. It's funny. I think that there are certain. Um, again, I'm coming from inside the world I'm I'm in. There's certain um, networks uh, like Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, who deliberately create spaces either in their linear or their digital worlds to sort of like find talent, develop it, create this kind of farm league. So, like Comedy Central's app was essentially a um, a farm team to sort of develop, find t- comic talent when there's when they're just coming up give them a platform, whatever hits there, they would start putting on the Windows network. I think, uh, you know, Adult Swim is another one where they try out all sorts of different, very small format things. And then the ones that do hit, they were able to expand them out. I don't think that we at any of our networks have really gotten mature enough at, at, at AMC networks just to, I guess, the opposite of toot our own horn. <laughs> like we have not actually had that sort of uh, codified a process. So I think that it's right we, where we are often looking to literally what we're all watching and obsessing over in social media and all these different forums, looking for this kind of talent that we may see a seed there either within the project they've actually done or just in the personality that we think there might be something more there and 
my group sort of becoming the stepping stone. So I'd take a couple quick examples there. One thing that has been on the air for a while, one that has not come on yet is um, the Norman Reedus show, Ride with Norman Reedus. Norman Reedus is on, he plays Daryl on The Walking Dead. Um, we did a sort of a little mini digital series with him. He's obsessed with motorcycles. Uh, we did just a little digital series about him and his motorcycle. Um, ended up getting, uh, he was sort of, had such a rabid fan base. It did incredibly well, particularly on Instagram, where he has a very big following, big enough that our unscripted team at the Linear Network picked it up and turned it into a show. And it's been on for about, I think, four seasons, five seasons now. Um, one that hasn't come out yet is we found, uh, we're working on some, not shockingly, we do a lot of uh, programming on Halloween, spooky season, uh, Fear Fest is big for all of our networks because of the kinds of shows we make. Um, we found a, a genuine medium and witch who does like a kind of, um, uh, it almost feels like an Art Bell style late night AM radio uh, call-in show that she sort of self did. It does literally no following, kind of came out of nowhere, uh, but we piloted a mid-form uh, series with her that we are going to start launching in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, knock on wood if we finish it in time. Um, and that's just like a personality, a moment. We were able to like come up with a format that fit her. Um, it's a place for us to have our existing talent from the network wash in and out. And um, it just kind of worked. But I think it's uh, being open to the talent and the formats and seeing what can be adapted. Awesome, awesome. All right, so let's go to a question we have uh, from the audience. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I butchered anybody's names because I'm just reading them. This happens on Twitch too. Um, so this is from uh, Chris Hadley, uh, Snobby Robot. Uh, for both of you, is comedy still the best and most viable genre for short form content? Or do other genres, drama, horror, thriller, et cetera, have an equal shot at visibility in the industry? Um, I have my opinion on this, but you guys go first. Should I, 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 so um, I, this is such a fantastic question, Chris. Um, so I, um, something that I didn't mention is the, so the way that I actually started working at Group 9 Media was because I started working, um, gosh, exactly four years ago, it was right before the election, um, for a comedy production studio called Jash that had started out as like a digital first uh, comedy uh, studio. It started out as a YouTube channel and it was co-founded by Sarah Silverman. Reggie Watts, Tim and Eric, and Michael Sarah. Um, and we, uh, there, it, it evolved over the years to, to being strictly just, you know, short form digital content. Then um, I, I joined when they started developing things more for television and feature films. Then um, we started partnering with Now This on a lot of things because the uh, the politics at our company was very progressive. Um, and then we were acquired by Group 9. And very, very gradually over the last three years, all all of my love for comedy is just kind of, kind of absorbed into these other formats but uh, or these other um, genres. Uh, so I would say the majority of what I work on is unscripted, but um, we we are often working with talent who are have a comedy background, regardless of whether it's like, for example, a show for Seeker, which is our science and technology brand. Um, we're currently casting for um, a talk show that might be on their linear channel. That's kind of like almost the last week tonight, but for science. And so we're working with comedians for that. Um, but I, you know, uh, when you say horror, there was a, um, a, uh, a scripted, a half hour scripted kind of co horror comedy show that we were pitching for a little bit. Um, and the, uh, it was with um, an actress named, um, oh my, I can't believe I'm blacking on her last name, Julie. She was on Orange is the New Black. Um, hold on one second. Uh, and she had these amazing, um, like basically these like really scary kind of horror um, self, you know, self-made videos that she was posting on social media that people thought were like, you know, she was trying to make it appear as though, you know, in your like classic Blumhouse, you know, uh, horror movie that they were like really happening to her. Um, and then we kind of started developing with her on a, um, on a half an hour series uh, that um, we unfortunately weren't able to sell, but I feel, I feel like if you can be creative um, and uh, and if you can kind of take the tools that you have right now um, to to create something that feels very authentic, I think that across the genres um, that there that there would be legs for for whatever you're you're building. 
Um, yeah, I would, uh, I have a sort of more complicated answer because of one reason. First of all, Snobby Robot, great name. Um, assuming it's not your real name. Um, I would say that like when I first, we assumed uh, starting a few years ago that comedy is obviously the, it so fits so well to short form. It is so consumable. It can be standalone. It can be serialized. Um, um, but the caveat I'd give there and the reason we are moving away from just straight comedy, although I agree with Lily, we are always looking for, uh, even for sort of non-comedic shows working on, we're all, always looking for uh, comic talent for whether we're asking for a real comic sensibility or whether we want the kind of ability to think on your feet, the ability to do improv, um, all those things that are sort of endemic to being uh, in the, the comedy space. It travels so well to other sort of unscripted or docu-series or talk show formats. Um, but the reason we don't do as much straight comedy is actually it comes down to uh, uh, brands and um, some of the economics of what we're doing specifically. And this may not be the same for, for you, Bernie and Lily, or anybody else who's watching, but um, one of our you know important revenue streams is integrating brands into some of our content. Um, and while most brands want to be a part of things that are fun, they don't necessarily, they're not always looking for like, we want a comedy series. And weirdly, sometimes that is something that is positioned as straight up comedy is actually less attractive to some of the brands we're looking for. I think partially that's just because I think comedy can be perceived as more controversial maybe, or um, maybe uh, it, it's perceived and I don't I don't know that I agree with this perception maybe it's perceived as not being as safe as some of the other formats um, but when we go out with something that seems like a no-brainer this is a straight comic uh, series uh, we have less success in bringing brands in and therefore like it kind of uh, moves us away so we'll often use that kind of talent but we'll put them into maybe darker or different kinds of formats rather than straight up comedy that um I just want to add to that, Kev. I, I actually two point two points. So I'll try to keep it quick. Um, the first one is what you said about comedians and brands is like is so spot on because we've also worked on a number of branded contents. And for those in the audience who don't know, branded often means a, a company like um, Starbucks or McDonald's or Nike pays our studios to make content that looks like it's, you know, uh, it's kind of like an advertorial. It looks like you know it's something that's original and authentic, but you've got a lot of product integration. And we actually had one with a, a bank. I'm not going to say which one. Mitch Hurwitz, who created Arrested Development, directed it. We had some amazing comedians who were featured on it, like big names. And it never actually aired because one of the comedians we featured had made a joke three years ago that the company found out about and they axed the whole thing. So like that happens. But um, another thing, you know, um, again, to go back to Chris's question, uh, comedy, yes, of course, comedy is really sticky. It's like, it's something that is very uh, uh, immediately appealing and attractive and translates. But I, another thing that we're seeing a lot and that my company is looking for is experts. So even if you're not a comedian, if you are an expert in a field, um, I'm thinking specifically about like Seeker, our science brand, uh, we're, you know, uh, Thrillist, which is our food, drink, travel, entertainment brand. Um, now this is like news and, um, news and social justice. So there's like, uh, if you are somebody who is the best in your field at something, um, and that's coming through, that's something that that's, you're a person we want to work with. And you're also a person who the TV networks and the streaming platforms, eventually, if we want to be developing it into something long form, they're going to want as well, authenticity and, you know, um, access and being, being like a, like a head voice in your field. Awesome, awesome. Um, I'm going to add to, to the kind of specific to the non-comedy side, the drama and thriller side. Um, the reason why, and this is theory and opinion, why, why I think comedy is so dominant in in just contents on form is that it's it's it, it can be easy. Like for a lot of us are filmmakers here, um, you don't you can lower your production value a little bit and pull off great comedy. It's really hard to lower your production value and pull off great sci-fi or great horror or great, great drama. You have to like be able to immerse your viewer into that dramatic moment or a thriller moment or sci-fi moment. And there are certainly tons of examples of people doing viral sci-fi videos, viral horror horror pieces that have led to 
um, series orders or movie deals or whatever. So that, that there are plenty of those out there, but they are definitely uh, the bar is higher for that stuff because you have that that threshold of it's got to feel like a horror, and that just creates a lot. It, it requires a lot more production value, design, mood, music, uh, all that stuff. And so, versus a, a comedy sketch, you know, the three of us could do a comedy sketch right now if we have one written, literally like this. <laughs> and 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 uh, it's just the it, the the, the, the uh, opinion of the audience whether or not that's actually funny or not. So that um, that's just my opinion from having done comedies, dramas, sci fis in short form. Um, that that's where I think the barrier lies. So, all right, let's go to the next question. Sarah, show us the next question, please. <laughs> Here it is. All right. <laughs> Um, Zach Van Manen from Retcon asks, are the clout calling card shows best served by good festival laurels or do they work with smart targeted pitching too? Especially at the moment as we're all permanently online. So the, the idea of the, uh, just to clarify this what I think, so Zach's thinking that, okay, um, I've got work maybe in this festival, it's terrible fest right now. Uh, I'm even thinking as a calling card, I want this to lead to more work as maybe a writer director or something like that as an actor. And and what what is the uh, the kind of point of view of that for uh, his like personal and other creator strategies in this space? What would you uh, say? I'll, I'll, if you mind, Larry, I'll start. Um, I I think because of uh, one of the brands under in my group is the uh, Sundance uh, TV, which is obviously closely aligned with the festival. Um, uh, that means that my group is uh, very plugged into sort of the festival circuit. We we tend to do straight up acquisition of short films, um, not even short form series, just to sort of, uh, there's a couple reasons to do it. One is just sort of a uh, little inside baseball. If you ever watch Sundance TV, the channel, you'd be like, what the hell does this have to do with Sundance? You're going to watch like, it's going to be showing you like the Shawshank Redemption 15 times a day. Um, and uh, you know, law and order marathons. I mean, like, what the hell? Um, so, and that's because just it's a channel that has had done less and less original programming and the original programming arm of Sundance has really migrated online. We did a digital series with Nick Hornby uh, called State of the Union. We're going to be doing another one of those. We do have like a rotating series of uh, online short film festivals. Uh, so the, the we are looking for some sort of pedigree from festivals just because we're plugged into there. But um, the other way we work just to do more, another little bit inside baseball is that my team is also pretty small and we are always working with outside production companies, uh, production services companies, uh, smaller boutique shops uh, as sort of our arms as we're producing things. So they're coming to us with stables of people that they have found either just through their own channels, through their own looking at awards and festivals, or just through scouring um, and sort of their own connections. So I think that there's value in looking um, and making connections to not just like the big known names like AMC networks or um, Buzzfeed or whatever, but looking around, there's there's many of these sort of smaller production entities that we are always all working with, and they're always coming to us with talent that we've never seen or heard before. Um, and I think if you watch any of the stuff that we make you'll see um, the names and the credits of companies that um, uh, like, uh, just to list some of those, right now we're working with uh, some places like Hyper RPG, which does Twitch, uh, MBTV, which does um, a lot of um, uh, spirits and cocktail-based things, um, Bacon and Sons, which does a lot of scripted content, uh, Industrial Color, which does a lot of unscripted and docu-series. Like that, there's a lot of these sort of like, if you sort of went and did a little scouring for that. I think that's a nice way to sort of, that'll connect you to a lot of places like us because they work, they're agnostic, they work across all those places. Nice. Um, Kevin, that, that's such a good point. And I and I, um, I just want to reiterate again how, um, you know, when you're looking at bringing your work to the marketplace, um, it's I, I, I think there's a lot of value in partnering with a production company or a smaller production studio who has those relationships with, a buyer um, or, you know, a platform that is looking for short form content, because then you have somebody who has already been vetted, like they, you know, uh, a, a Quibi or, um, or like a Netflix or AMC network will, will know, oh, like we've worked with this 
company, this production company before, we trust them. Oh, they have this new creator that they're working with. Oh, I'll definitely check that out. Um, so I think that that is when, when looking at doing your networking and pitching, I think really expanding and starting, starting there is a really good place. Um, and I think, and I don't know if I'm answering this question correctly, but like whether you should go more the festival route or, or kind of just self-distributing and pitching. I mean, I think it's really just to do a little bit of everything. Um, like specifically with like this festival, I've had some really amazing meetings with very, very talented filmmakers and, and, um, performers. And, uh, I'm going to be bringing, uh, the fact that, I, people who I would never have been connected with. And I'm going to be bringing all of these ideas to my colleagues and to some of these, you know, digital brands that I work with to say, Hey, this is a really cool series. Are you interested in funding further episodes? Our budgets are pretty small, <laughs> might be unlikely, but more, more likely they're going to say, they're either going to have a project that they've already sold someplace that they want to be producing and we're maybe going to be able to hire those filmmakers to execute it. Or maybe these filmmakers have an idea that would be perfect for um, now this. Now this is doing a lot of true crime stuff. Um, and we could then pitch it out as a long form. So, I mean, there's so many different, there are so many different routes you could take. And then once you get to making those connections, there are so many other different branches of the trade. Nice, nice. All right, uh, keep those questions coming in, guys, uh, through the audience. But I have a question for, for you guys now. Um, a lot of creators here in the room, uh, they, a lot of them probably have made shows, probably for this festival. Again, three episodes, five episodes, 10 episodes. So we've talked about the kind of, all right, uh, calling card aspect. Oh, your show is deemed good by whatever arbiter, Starable Fest pitches, whatever it is, people watching it, all right, audience, okay. And then uh, people look at that and go, we want to work with this creator or this actor or whatever and do more stuff with them. But let's just take the the, the form that they've created, those those three episodes, those five episodes, ten episodes, okay? What can our audience do with that content in today's landscape and the future landscape? Is there a marketplace for just like, are there people just scooping up uh, five, ten minute, ep- ten five minute episodes, uh, whatever? Like, uh, it, it, does that currently exist? Um, that's something actually I'm very curious myself about. Like, what does that landscape look like right now? Um, I can, I, I don't, I'm hopefully going to be answering your question, Bernie. I mean, actually I'm working with Hulu on a deal, uh, basically like a licensing, are you talking about like a licensing deal where yeah, right. somebody, licensing yeah. Deal. So, yeah. Perfect. yeah, so, so, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so yeah, I, so, you know, once you've kind of self, self produced your own content, if you're trying to sell it, then that would be often like some sort of a licensing deal or some sort of, or like you bring it in IJ world, you could bring it to like a, a platform that is like a SVOD or AVOD and, um, or do some sort of like a rev share split. And I think Kevin is even more knowledgeable about the business of that than I am um, personally. But for example, we're doing something for the Dodo with Hulu where they wanted to buy 20, some they wanted to buy 20 minute episodes of Dodo shows. And we're basically taking short form content, five minute episodes of, and, and kind of cutting them together to make it look like 20 minutes. Like it was like on a TV, like a TV show and I've sold it to them. Um, so I think that, uh, again, this gonna, maybe goes back to my, one of my last, uh, my last points is if you are able to work with a production company that has these arrangements already, that has a distribution team that is licensing content to, I mean, there are like so many different um, new uh, networks and platforms that are just hungry for content, stuff like Pluto, Zumo. I, I can't even like, they all sum it up, but they're, but they're like really looking for that. And so often what we were doing even back in the Josh days was we had a Pluto channel. And so we were like, well, we need to populate this. And we just found, we would just go online and find these comedians making these amazing short form, like short videos and we would license it from them and then they would be on Pluto as part of the Josh channel. So that's, that's a way to go about it. And so that the entry entry point in many cases is working with a a production company or a distributor. Yeah, I think it's very, my answer is very similar. I think it's, it's the old school like indie film model where you're like, you're going to, you're going to, you can get to profitability. It's not going to be one, you're not going to get it in one big bite. There's going to be like lots of little bites. You're going to make some money in ad revenue in places like YouTube, not much because the split sucks. You know, you're going to make a little bit of ad revenue in some other platforms if you use them. Uh, then you can, we often license a lot of our stuff internationally. Uh, you go territory by territory. It's very tedious, but again, that sort of covers off some more of your budget. And then I think the the SVOD and AVOD, like the Plutos, uh, 
Fast Channel, all those are, uh, they're hungry for content uh, and they were that way even before COVID hit uh, because they are, you know, so for instance, we we um, have a channel on IMDb TV. It's meant to be a 24 hour uh, Walking Dead channel. There's only so much Walking Dead you can put on there. So all of our short form is being recut to create mid form and episodes. Um, all the same things you're talking about because we need to fill those pipes. I think what we're also seeing, frankly, is that even traditional linear channels and SVODs like Hulu, Netflix, we at AMC just launched AMC Plus, which is an SVOD channel that brings together all of our traditional net networks along with Shutter, IFC Films, Sundance Now, Acorn, Urban Movie Channel. There's probably something else um, into sort of one series of bundled kind of thematic channels. They're just hungry for more. And that was before the fact that it became harder and harder to create new TV shows, which frankly, we're just starting up production for linear TV right now, which means there's a hole that all these networks need to fill and all these SBODs need to fill, uh, which means that it's been very like frothy, I think, that people are looking for stuff. I think that it's fine and good to say, I think to your point, Lily, like the connection between you sitting here on your YouTube channel uh, channel saying I've created this stuff, how do I get those five steps to be talking to the right person at Hulu or Pluto or an AMC Plus? Um, I think those sort of production and services companies and those production entities are like, or, or even agencies and management companies or other ones that are plugged in to sort of help make some of those connections. But the reality is that, it, that it's out there. Cool. Um, before we get to the another audience question, I just have a question for you guys that I don't know if you will to fully answer. Um, without without an NDA or something like that, but I'm actually curious myself. Like, what do those deals look like right now? Is it like, I'll, I'll preface this right. YouTube's one is very transparent. It's it's you your money up front. You're a partnership. You get it's a 55 45 split. The CPM sucks unless someone's selling ads for you. If you, you if you, you want to make a thousand dollars, you got to get two million views, right? Which is a, a big number for a YouTube uh, series at this point. Um, so that that's just not sustainable, right? They, like you said, you're gonna need other things. So what what does a licensing deal kind of what what can they what can our creators expect? Like is there an upfront or is it strictly a rev split? Or like what can you say to that in a current marketplace? I, I don't know that it's a one size fits all. I'd say there's a few categories. There is just the rev share you just described with YouTube. You got nothing up front. You're just sort of doing the best you can. It's gonna take a lot to get there. With the international stuff, uh, which is agnostic of a particular platform, it's often a percentage of production budget. It's a small percentage, but you're gonna you can start to cobble together five percent of production here, five percent there. Um, but that's usually how that works as a percentage. And then I think with some of the SBOD services, it's a straight up fee with a uh, we've seen a straight up fee with a rev share behind it. Um, that the hurdle to get to that rev share can be higher or lower depending on the the property and the platform like sometimes that's realistic and sometimes it's bullshit and you're never going to make it past there so the fee is all you're going to get um and it's kind of on a case by case good will you anything to add we should go to the, go to the question nothing now okay. let's <laughs> nothing to add. kevin uh spoke the, to it yeah uh, pretty much said everything that i would say um yeah and unfortunately that's not um licensing distribution output that's not actually what i personally do so i don't want to i don't want to give any misinformation i mostly focus on the the creative original programming aspects of things totally and and, and there's so much out there i i remember um just a, for the question like lizzie bennett diaries and emma approve were both licensed on all these like digital platforms and and we weren't the ones doing that like I, I, our team wasn't the ones doing all those deals it was the uh the current, I think, I don't know if they're sold even around, the Stars Digital's team, I was like, oh, we're going to put it on full screen. We're going to put it on Amazon. We're going to put it on iTunes. And then they did all those deals separately. And some of them, I'm sure, were upfront, and others were just like splits, you know? So uh, it, it, it totally varies back then. And I couldn't even tell you what those numbers were. I just do know that that revenue did come in, which was nice, you know? So, so anyway, all right, let's go to that next question. Sarah, throw it up on the screen for us, please. All right. Uh, Abby and Militio, Militio? Uh, what about using a short to launch a long form series rather than a feature? Do distributors and nets actively search them out as new media gains greater market presence? Thanks. So, clarifying, give it up, using a short to launch a long form series. So, I'm going to put up a five minute, 10 minute uh, short. And we've heard people putting up short films to say, hey, I'll make this a feature. We're asking now, 
using that to say, this is a television pitch. Um, I actually have an experience with this, but I want to hear you guys, <laughs> you guys first, literally doing this. All right. So I'll talk about it, but you guys go first. Um, well, I would say that if you're more interested in doing TV than film, you're actually in a really good place right now because that's really where much more of the the, um, the interest is right now just due to um, the economy of, of films. Uh, you know, uh, and that's honestly what my company has shifted almost entirely around away from making features into really focusing on, on making te- television series when we're trying to sell um, something linear. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that that, um, I, and I, again, um, and I w- I'm really curious to hear um, what Bertie and Kevin have to say. I can speak mostly from my personal experience working at a production company and a production studio that it, it's really, really good to part, like the, yes, of course, networks are looking um they're always like looking for something new. They often don't have the bandwidth to be the ones doing the searching. Um, they're and and unless you have created something that has gone to, like insanely viral and is like a big talking point uh, for people like around the country, around the globe, um, it's really the production companies who are the ones who are kind of doing doing the scouting and the scout and the the scouring. So again, building those connections with production companies is really going to do you a really um, a, a big big service. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. I, the one thing I'd say about to to uh, to this festival's horn, like we we've, we've had a bunch of meetings with uh, filmmakers during this uh, festival, and the people on my side taking these meetings, there's a combination of myself who's working in the digital space as well as people working with in our traditional uh, linear and uh, SBOD development team. We're taking those meetings together because. Um, it's possible, we're not 100% sure where it'll fit. It could be something we wanna just continue either the, the property itself or the talent uh, in the digital space in short form, or this could be a, a calling card to put somebody like, get somebody as an assistant in a room for an existing show, help them build the room for a new show, a uh, writer's room is what I'm talking about for a new show. So uh, I think uh, things like this, this festival uh, and other production companies I think it tends to be where I'm at. Um, we're now kind of tandem teams looking at this stuff from a, from a bunch of different angles. Uh, so it's a good time to sort of look at short as a calling card for long form uh, TV. Sure. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So my experience of this personally, and this is public, so you can actually look this up. It's on the trades. A um, couple of years ago, 2015, 2016, I want to say we did. We I partnered with this production company uh, that had. Um, we'll just say they had some MTV roots. And this was back when MTV was doing shows scripted shows and uh, they they wanted we, we, they, we partnered together to do like a, a, a teen thriller uh, we'll call it digital pilot right <laughs> like we'll call it that right and um, we did it uh, they funded it and it was like it was a pretty expensive like high high quality pilot digital pilot and so we sh- we did this we shot this pilot we have a trailer and that and then we announced it uh, on Hollywood Reporter, I believe. Uh, the, the project is called Socio, S-O-C-I-O. Again, you can look this up. Um, just You can search that in my name. You'll see that. You'll see the announcement. And MTV's executive, from my memory, saw it on the trades and then called or emailed that executive that she knew, not us, the the, the other production company, and say, hey, we should talk about this. And it's like, all right, sure. <laughs> like, so so we go we go in, we pitch to MTV, they basically buy the series or they will buy the pro, the IP and then we develop it as a, as a TV pilot. Um, you know, it went down because MTV stopped doing TV shows, but that's it's still a win because you got to TV pilot uh, area there and and um, it went on you know, to, to basically die in development. But I think everybody in this room uh, would, would take that deal. Like I would take that deal now, still right now. So like uh, I, that's a, that's a you know good good measure of success. If you sold a TV show, like like it's all good. I and that's something that's very real. And I think you know in the current landscape of everybody has a streaming platform. Um, everybody's doing some version of short form. Look, Disney Plus is doing short form. It's there. You go on the platform, it's there. All of it's branded Disney. So it's like, you know, Pixar stuff and like Muppet stuff, but it is there. And and at some point you got to think that they're going to branch out or they're looking for people to execute short form content for them. Uh, so th- everyone has it and and it's up to you guys to, to uh, take, a, take a look at that. Um, keep asking those questions. I'm not sure how much time we have left, but uh, we can, can just. Well, let me just add on that. Um, right. uh, at this year's Emmys, uh, 
which we won for best short form. Um, Congrats. Yes, it was pretty awesome. But the category was insane this year because of everything you just mentioned. What was in the category were like high, big budget things from Disney, from CBS All Access. Quibi, of course, had multiple categories of things. NBC did an entire series, short form series around the good place. Like, um, and they didn't just do these things uh, just to try and win awards or just to like do favors for big uh, shows for them. Although I think talent relations and sort of expanding the worlds of shows is, is always a part of it. I think it's to your point, like the lines have become so blurry with so many platforms that uh, all these different formats, all these different lengths, they all have u- utility for them. So there's more and more reasons for them to, to do them, not just as calling cards or, or training wheels for a bigger show, but in and of themselves. There's just more and more of it every year. Like each, if you look at the category, the short form category of the last 10 years and see how it's grown um, to what it was this year, uh, you can sort of see the evolution in it. Yeah, I, I, I would say as some, someone who's gone through the process, like there, there are windows for different categories. There are windows that you can try to go and, and if, you, if, you, if you're chasing awards, I'm saying. And you, and you can and you can't. Like as someone who's won awards and um, know that awards look nice and they sound great and it's really cool to go to award shows, but know that they're not made of gold and they don't pay for your bills. So like uh, it, it, it totally varies. Um, but if you are chasing those awards, the, there are windows where you got, where uh, us as independents can go in there and try to win one. Um, very, very doable with the right strategy. I mean, for Megan, I think someone said in the chat, and like that, like that, that that was close twice. They got two nominations. I mean, that's that's amazing. Uh, so, I uh, very real. Okay, so let's let's um. Oh, I had I had, I had a, a question on on something like that. And I completely forgot it. <laughs> but but uh uh. So going to let me think about this. Um, look, looking. Oh, we got a question. We got another question. Never mind. Let's go to that. Uh, Sarah, is this coming? Am I reading this or is this question coming up? The Gerald per, uh, parade question, Parati. Okay, I'm reading it. Um, how does a writer director uh, who is not a performer personality build a social media audience? So, um, to clarify, this is a little different than say a strict calling card because the, for example, socio. And granted, okay, I, I had a bit of a, a calling a clout by then, but that wasn't because it got a million views. It be, it, 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 it went viral. It was just because it was a cool piece of content that we we did. So Gerald is asking uh, as a writer director. Um, not a performer, not a personality, no one, not someone who's going to be on screen in front of the camera. How are they going to build a social media audience to, to kind of be that branded creator? You know, um, how, what, what, what do you guys say to that? Hmm. Anybody? Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'll go. I think only just because you're still on mute. Um, uh, that's a great question. I think my, oh, the unsatisfying answer I'd say is that I feel like that's easy nothing's easy, but that's easier to do or easier for me to imagine in a scripted space than the unscripted space, obviously, that that um, in the unscripted and comedy and even like the docu-series space, um, although that's kind of like a gray area between the two, the personality is so tied in with the writing and the and the look and the voice. It's all one and it's, it's very hard to pry it apart. That's what you're going for. But once you start to get into like docu-series, scripted series, um, then uh, uh, then it's really just about the work. And again, just to go back to this festival, we were looking at a lot of scripted uh, series and some of the meetings we were having. And, you know, obviously the, the, the people in those are, the, the producers and the writers, directors behind that um, are, you know, it's just like anything else. It's, we're, we're able to see right there what their, what their creations are um, and understand it. I think if you're writing, say you're writing like a, a talk show or you're writing kind of a documentary, it's a little harder to separate yourself out from whatever the personality is who's who's leading that. Um, so it's like the scripted webisode space is the easiest answer for that. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kevin, I'm having, I'm also trying to think of um, some like really concrete uh uh, advice here. I mean, I think that uh, if you're a re- if you're a writer, um, I, sp- and I, I hate to every- always bring everything back to comedy, but like your social like your social platform should be Twitter. Um, uh, and um, so you kind of think about what medium, what we which which of these social platforms is the best for your medium. If you're a filmmaker who's doing really interesting, cool 
dynamic like shots and setups, I feel like um, TikTok is a great place to be um, or Instagram because these are like very like, um, um, you know, can be very fast videos They and you could be uh, finding just uh, new and inventive ways of of telling stories to the world in a way where there might not be any humans featured at all. I, you know, um, you can really think at the side of the box there, but then, uh, and, um, you know, easy answer, but sometimes hard in execution, find a performer who you really connect with and you can become, uh, partners. And as that performer is growing, you are going to be growing with them, um, in terms of, um, gaining follow, hopefully gaining followers, but getting, getting in the room, getting meetings. Yeah, this is a really hard question. I'm thinking about myself because I am a writer director. I do have a moderate social following, we'll say. Nothing, I mean, by I say moderate, I mean, it's like I, I have a blue check mark on Facebook. I have 10,000 on Twitter. But these aren't giant, you know, blow, blow, your, blow your socks off numbers. that They're, they're not going to get shows greenlit or whatever. Like they're, they're just there, right? And it's because I've have, I have shows that have generated audiences that people like, presumably, or hate. <laughs> they didn't want to follow me. Um so I'll give you a story with this. So um, on YouTube, there's this community called the, uh, I think called like the, the film essays. They like analyze films or TV shows. And, and these, are, these are people who are primarily filmmakers. Like I've met, actually met a few of them and I won't name specifically who they are, but I actually ta- I reached out to them like, hey, what do you want to do? I mean, you're great at these film essays. I learn stuff from them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I feel I learned stuff from them. The, your analysis of these films and TV shows that I like and you're like, oh, I want to really want to do a feature film. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Like, like you know, how are you going to do that? And I don't remember the idea or anything like that, or if, even if there was a pitch. But I, I haven't heard that they these guys have broken out and suddenly gone from analysis world to creative world, you know. Uh, they clearly, in my mind, totally get how to, what is a good story, why it's good, what makes a bad story, why it's bad. They got that down in spades, probably better than, some, you know, us in many areas, not saying all areas, many areas, right? And you would think that could just translate into, uh, you know, like, oh, let's look at that creator. Like the, this person knows what they're doing. And I know we weren't the only people that were meeting with them, but it was just kind of interesting to see that they do have a social following. They have large social followings that they, people love their analysis of short films and future films and TV shows and so forth. And you're not seeing that at least yet to translate into, at least for publicly, you maybe, maybe they have 20 development deals <laughs> like, like uh, that, that aren't announced that are back there. Maybe they do, right? Who knows? Um, and you're not seeing that yet. So I find, I find that interesting. And it's like, and I'll say that but really uh, as we start to wrap up to that question, it's really interesting because you mentioned social media specifically. So that means that you're trying to go for an audience. It's like, what do you want that audience to do specifically? Like, like when you guys, the, uh, um, uh, our panelists look at, look at audiences for a talent, they're like, oh, if I put this person in my show and they have a hundred thousand Instagram followers, theoretically, large portion of those unsealed followers will come and watch the show I do with them on this new platform. Right. Theoretically, we can talk about conversion metrics later at another time, but that's the idea, okay? From a creator's perspective, maybe you say like, okay, if I had 100,000 Instagram followers for whatever reason, and I, and, and I could convert that, maybe that does move the needle for you guys a little bit. I just don't know if that would really be, because I'm not in the show, unless I'm in the show, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm, I'm asking. I'm throwing this out here. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, pull a pull a thought from you guys. Like, like, I writer directors in the scripted space are this kind of thing. It's like, yes, Christopher Nolan obviously has an audience, and like, like uh, um, Aaron Sorkin and Jared, uh, David Fincher. Like, what do you think about that? It's like, it's is it? It's not the audience. It's like it's like the, the fact that they've done really good stuff, right? That uh, I, I think. Really- Leo, you gave a great, I wish I uh, had shut up and let you just give me the answer, Leo, because that was a much better answer. <laughs> exactly. As a writing voice, there are obviously platforms where you don't need to be a performer. And I think the film essay one is a great example to bring up as well. Like, we're actually developing a show that is a kind of, um, oh, I don't know what to call it, it's sort of a hybrid of a drunk history and like a film essay kind of show of sort of getting people sort of very smart uh, writers in a room to on the fly with challenges, you know, think up a movie that fits a genre and a structure. And those are the kinds of people we are talking to, not necessarily performers per se, but people who do those kinds of film essays and show off a kind of 
incredible knowledge and voice and personality in a different way than you would think with a normal stand-up comedian. The other example I give is um, the team, a lot of the people behind uh, Conan O'Brien's digital, um, uh, some of whom are still there and some of whom have moved on, all of them had uh, an incredible voice that they brought to that content. And obviously it's Conan O'Brien who's the performer there, but it was clear to see in things like, you know, Clueless Gamer and some of the other stuff they were doing digitally, that there was a voice beneath that that was like, oh, who made that? Like, I know that person isn't on camera, but that's somebody who has a sensibility that I can, that, so there are places where the voice of the talent sort of behind the camera will come out, uh, even if there's like a big personality in front of the camera. Nice. Yes, I completely agree. Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, because granted, it benefits me if it, personally. But all right. Um, <laughs> I think we are out of time. Um, I, so thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, Lily, Kevin, any final thoughts, sagely words of advice for our, our uh, intrepid, terrible audience today? Or you could just say thanks. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> Lily, you're muted, I think. Or you're muted. Right, come on. Kevin. Yeah. I'll, I'll go, sagely I'm, advice. Ah, sagely advice. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's. I think the the advice is this: that the number of places you should be talking to is greater than you think. You should just keep digging into the people behind the the people behind the people making the stuff you you like, um, and talk to them. And then I think just be understanding that. The world is opening it up, up in a, it's a, the lines between short form and mid form and long form and where those all live is blurring so much that the opportunities are, are really growing. Um, I think a lot of the gatekeepers are falling to the wayside. We've been saying that for like 10 years, but it's, it's, it's really true when you're seeing it come to life now. So I just keep plugging away and keep uh, widen your list of people you're talking to, to some of these other production companies. Billy, you back? Nope, she lost her sound. All right. Uh, all right. Well, I'll say I'll say some sagely things. <laughs> so, so just as I say this all the time, uh, I said this last year. It's terrible. I said it the year before. Um, to these, these, to you, the creators out there in the audience today, um, I really recommend that you think of a singular goal that you want from your shows, for you or your shows, your or your career. Right now, it doesn't mean you can't get the other goals. Like if your goal is to get profitability and you sell to a network and you're not profitable, that's not a win. I'm saying that you should focus on a singular goal first, one at a time, because that focus will drive you to, to ideally a better greater chance of success. So is it grow an audience for your IP, yourself, or whatever? Is it uh, profitability, you know, sustainability, making money for your IPs, licensing at all these places and so forth? Is it the up format deal, the television deal, okay? These are all different goals. They are not inclusive. They're actually probably exclusive from each other. And you, and yet everybody in this room would probably take all three. So mm -hmm. just as someone who's done this a long time with a lot of different shows that have done these goals separately, you know, in different ways. Example, Lizzie Bennett Diaries, profitable, never had a TV deal. Never had a TV deal. Never, it's never happened. I know if the, those of you, if you're fans of that show, you're like, what? How is that impossible? It just never happened. <laughs> like we had discussions, never, no one ever offered a TV deal for Elizabeth Diaries, yet it was profitable, it was hugely, you know, grew an audience, et cetera. So successful, right? And again, Socio, perfect, the, the MTV one I gave an example. No one's ever seen that film. Like no one's ever seen it. Like it's like, only been seen in, in private settings and links and whatever and panels and so forth. Got a TV deal. I got paid to write the show, you know, or the pilot. So that's a win. These are separate wins. So I really recommend that you as a creator think about for your show, currently that you're working on or your career, you have that singular goal first. You can pivot later. You can change your goals later. But right now, step one, identify that one goal, go for that one goal, and do your best to hit it. Lily's back. She's not. What happened? Her audio died. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Lily says she agrees that everybody <laughs> Kevin and myself, <laughs> go go follow her on some Instagram or Twitter. I think I don't know if she's actually on social. I didn't see her links to the thing. <laughs> Message her on Goof Nine, um, and uh, or I am her. You can I am her, I believe. So you can just I am her if you want to have any questions for this. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, keep. She says keep making incredible work. Keep building community. 
this festival has been a wonderful experience. So you should message her more to keep this experience wonderful for her. Same with Kevin, because he's having one wonderful experience. Um, you can message me too. I'm on here too. And I'm on the socials, just my name, easy to find. And uh, thank you very much, everybody. Have a great festival. Enjoy your Saturday. My days are all messed up. <laughs> and have a great day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks,